علم عراقي هذا العلم ليلة وعلم كلو الله كريم شلاما لوخون نيوم تي مخبه انا يوين موفينا لازر بمطاين اللوخون من مذيتة شيكاغو بقليتون لي بتمرخطخ لي اها خرزة بليشانة انجلس نايا قد تماطيني شت همزمتن لناشا ودر من امتن هلبت علي مقو امتن First and foremost, thank you all for tuning in. Today we'll be providing you with a brief update on the Nineveh Plain Protection Units, their participation in the liberation of Mosul and the Nineveh Plain. So the Nineveh Plain Protection Units, as many of you may have seen on ANB, heard on Facebook, Twitter, or other forms of social media, is currently participating in the liberation of Mosul and the Nineveh Plain. They were selected to fight alongside an the anti-ISIL coalition, which included Iraqi forces, Peshmerga forces, US, British, and French forces as well. The anti-ISIL coalition had set a specific date to launch the liberation of Mosul. Prior to that liberation beginning, 350 NPU soldiers were selected to participate within uh, the anti-ISIL coalition. Just days before the liberation, another 250 NPU soldiers were called upon to join the ranks of the NPU and fight on the front lines. Since the beginning of the liberation, the NPU was located on two separate axes preparing for the Iraqi forces to start the battles. They have participated in the liberation of several villages within the Nineveh Plain. Thus far, the Nineveh Plain Protection Units have secured multiple villages and still remain on some of those lands, including Baghdada, Batnaya, and Karamlish. With that being said, specifically within Baghdada, um, our NPU soldiers have had to fight off ISIS directly. Although ISIS soldiers were pushed off by majority, a few of them remained in tunnels that were built within the villages. The NPU soldiers have had to deal with a few surprise attacks where a couple of our soldiers have been injured. Since those injuries, a few of them are recovering while one or two of them have returned to the front lines because they feel the need to join their brothers and continue that battle. Our soldiers are remaining on those lands and willing to protect those lands. Now we need to figure out how it is that we can support them and move forward to help secure those lands for our people. And that is why today we will be interviewing the president of the NPDF, the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund, Dr. Elmer Abbo, as soon as we return from this break. علم عراقي هذا العلم ليلة وعلم كلو الله كريم Thanks again for tuning in. As I mentioned before the break, uh, today we have with us the president of the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund, NPDF, Dr. Almer Abu. Pshanathaluk, Dr. Almer. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, Dr. Almer, I mean, one of the main things that everyone wants to know, you know, what is the NPDF? Right, the, uh, the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund. Yes, sir. Um, so we started the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund at the request of the NPU um, as a legal mechanism to um, 
basically fundraise for the Nineveh Plain Protection Units. Um, clearly, um, the Nineveh Plain Protection Units are part of the Iraqi Security Forces, and they are formally authorized. Um, however, um, just because they're formally authorized and they are receiving um, some support from the Iraqi military, it's clearly not enough support. Um, and it's certainly not coming quick and fast enough, but that is starting to improve to, to some extent. Um, that said, um, the NPU recognized that it, it had um, needs for additional resources, and so it was looking for a mechanism to essentially raise money from the diaspora, as well as other friends and supporters across the world, um, to help the NPU um, you know, accomplish its mission to essentially defend our lands from ISIS and help to hold and protect that land into the future. Um, the, the issue um, you know, became one of obviously uh, you know, critical, a critical nature after ISIS. It was clear that security um, was essential for our future there, that without meaningful security on the ground, that there was really no way that people would return to their villages, even if they were liberated. And, um, and maybe this is the most important, if they were liberated, but liberated by um, others, um, that essentially there wouldn't be the trust necessary for Assyrians to feel comfortable moving back into their homes and into their villages. And so it was essential that we, that we saw amongst the Assyrian people um, security force that came from the people by the people there. Um, and so when I saw the Nineveh Plain Protection Units um, you know, develop uh, and, and uh, grow, um, I, certainly, um, I certainly was under some uh, uh, enthusiasm for seeing it develop. Um, but I re recognized that it, it certainly was resource deprived. And when the NPU came to a group of Assyrians in the diaspora to say they needed some help in raising funds, I was certainly interested, but um, we wanted to make sure um, that it was done in a very legal, informal, um, accountable, transparent way. And, and so um, basically, um, you know, we put a lot of work in to make sure that we put together an organization that was uh, compliant with all US law um, to make sure that um, you know, no one would misunderstand what we were doing. And so what we are doing is raising money um, for the NPUs, but specifically for um, three main purposes, which is essentially for supplies and equipment, but none of it weapons or arms. Um, other base infrastructure or other infrastructure that's necessary for our security. Um, and three, um, uh, the training of individuals, um, whether they be some of our full-time soldiers or whether they be volunteer reservists. Th those were sort of the three purposes. And it's, it's key to emphasize that we're not purchasing um, weapons or arms. And that um, was clearly something that we came to um, in our understanding of recognizing that we had to comply with the US laws and that in order for us to be um, doing anything in that domain, we would have to essentially get a license through the State Department. Um, that's not to say that's not an option for the future, but it's not something that we're pursuing at this time. Thank you, thank you. So one of the main things that you pointed out is the legality aspect of things and everyone wanting to make sure that what they're what they're doing they're donating um, directly to this security force and it's being used for supplies and non munition non munition items mm -hmm. um, and that they're doing it legally so it's something right. that a lot of people bring up it's it's a common concern uh, but as you're saying it's 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 a topic that you guys have I want to say covered um, well we've done a pretty exhaustive review we um, First, on, first and foremost, we knew that we couldn't you know, do this ourselves. We needed the advice of legal counsel. So we sought out um, a lawyer with expertise in this area. And we were um, fortunate enough to be able to retain the advice of a former inspector general for the Department of Defense. His name is Joseph Schmitz. Um, and um, so he worked directly in government. He's now in private practice as a, as a lawyer. 
um, and with expertise, obviously, continuing in the defense industry. And so um, um, he was able to you know, review the laws and then review them with us. Basically, there, um, there's sort of three main findings to summarize. Um, you know, in terms of transferring financial money, um, as long as the government doesn't designate the whole country as a country of special concern, then in general you can transfer money to that country. So Iraq is not one of these countries of, of special concern. Um, however, the next question is whether or not the money is going for um, uh, a, a restricted um, use and the, basically there, and we're talking about if it's involved in essentially the purchase of weapons. If, if it's involved in the purchase of weapons, then yes, you need to have a special license from the State Department. But since we are transferring money not for the purpose of brokering or purchasing arms, um, we are just transferring money for the purpose of purchasing uh, you know, supplies, equipment, you know, paying for the training, um, base development, um, these kinds of things, um, there is no restriction on that. Um, we actually confirmed that opinion um, in a meeting with um, the State Department. The State Department has jurisdiction over uh, uh, the licensing of purchasing of arms. And when we met with the State Department, they acknowledged that um, the transactions that we were planning on in involving ourselves in um, were not under their jurisdiction. And so therefore, um, we felt that we um, had done the proper due diligence to be able to move forward. There is a final step, however, and that final step is, is we still need to produce um, the appropriate transparency and documentation to support the fact that the end use of the money that we're um, supplying is going for the purposes that we intend. In other words, if we intend to purchase a vehicle, we need to be able to demonstrate that the money truly went to purchase a vehicle. So as you can imagine, um, the, that type of documentation and accountability is, is essential for us to essentially be operating legally because there is a point at which um, the government might come and inspect our books and we have to be able to document exactly where every dollar went. And, and so that's the way we're going to move forward and, and, and operate. There is one other aspect um, that we um, also did as a part of our legal due diligence. Um, we registered the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund as an agent for the foreign entities of the Nineveh Plain Protection Units and the Assyrian Democratic Movement. We, um, we registered with the Department of Justice. Um, and so we are formally um, a representative of those um, bodies. Um, and uh, uh, you know that, um, that requirement and that registration comes with very formal documentation that we have to maintain every six months. We have to present information of um, our activities. Um, if we've been meeting with any um, uh, US government officials, um, and then most importantly, we have to regularly document um, how much money that we've raised and where that money has gone in terms of expenditures. It's very, very strict um, documentation. Um, in addition, we have to regularly report on informational materials that we distribute, um, including posts on Facebook and, and such. So um, it, it's a pretty exhaustive, um, it's a pretty exhaustive um, requirement, but we're happy to comply to be able to make sure that we're doing things according to US law. Wow, I mean, th that sounds like a lot of work, um, <laughs> but I, I will, on behalf of myself and our entire nation, thank you for putting the effort um, to do this legally, because that is, I mean, that's a big part of this. Um, nobody wants to, you know, put their own neck on the line and, and, and risk anything, you know, especially if we're just trying to support our security forces to protect those lands. Um, so thank you for doing your other people, other, mm -hmm. can you speak to any of those? Um, do you, are you familiar with any of them? Well, the, the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund is the only organization that's officially authorized um, by the Nineveh Plain Protection Units. Um, that official authorization comes in sort of, you know, two main facets. One I've already mentioned, which is we're formally registered to represent the Nineveh Plain Protection Units with our own U.S. government. However, um, it, before that, 
there was an agreement between um, the NPU and the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund, and we formally incorporated the Nineveh Plain Protection Units into the defense fund in terms of its board representation. So um, Yakub Yaku, um, the military chair for the Nineveh Plain Protection Units, sits on our board, and um, as the military chair, we put into our bylaws special rights that he has to be able to essentially veto decisions of our board. He can't unilaterally make decisions for our board, mm -hmm. but he can veto decisions. And so that gives him sort of special authority over our decision-making process. And formally, by him representing the NPU in Iraq, but also then obviously being on our board, we are officially tied organizationally to the NPU in that way. And so having him in that way in our bylaws officially tied plus the registration, the formal representation to our government saying that, that the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund officially represents this, this body that li that's, that's based in Iraq. Um, there is no other organization that has that relationship with the NPU. It's only the, N or it's only the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund as well because the way that we structured our bylaws, we are the only place where you can donate money that beyond the small amount of money that might be used for administrative costs, all of the rest of the money is guaranteed to go to the NPU. And why do I say that? Because that's the way our bylaws are structured. There's nothing else that we're spending the money for. We're not, we're not doing any other activities beyond raising money for the NPU. Great, thank you. Um, so the structure is there. Um, we've spoken to attorneys and figured out the legality aspect. The structure is there. The board is put together. Everything's ready to go. Um, I, I assume that there's been donations flooding in where, where do we stand right now? You mentioned that you guys are transparent with yes. everything. So how much money have we raised? How many people have donated? Where sure. do we stand right now? Sure. Um, well, we are transparent. Um, the website, the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund dot org, mm -hmm. um, the, the website has a, uh, a page on it that, you, you know, one can go online and they can see the amount of money that we've raised. They can get a sense of um, how many people, from what countries. Um, and so all of that is there. In the future, um, we'll also publicly declare where the money is going in terms of expenditures. But um, right now, we haven't given our first um, distribution yet. That'll be coming soon and probably um, within the next few the next few weeks. The um, In terms of the number of donors so far, we have approximately 130 donors so far. Um, they've contributed um, in hand about $24,000 and about 44000 pledged. The reason why there's a distinction there is because we give individuals the opportunity to either donate one time, like all, all, at na all right now, or um, to spread their contribution over the course of 12 months. Um, and basically, you know, the minimum donation that we're requesting is $150. So over 12 months, that's 12.50 a month. So it's it's really actually a modest amount of money, um, and if it's spread out over 12 months, m I mean most people could afford 12.50 a month. That's a couple cups of coffee or maybe three cups of coffee at Starbucks. So um, you know when we 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 did that intentionally so that we would encourage you know just anyone to be able to contribute. However, there are other levels of contribution, and we, you know, encourage everyone to be able to contribute what they feel they they are able to. Um, we certainly have seen an uptick in contributions um, since the Mosul operation started, um, and um, we are hopeful and optimistic that now that people see the NPU in action, they recognize that we are a legitimate fighting force um, that we have earned the respect of the Iraqi army, because clearly the Iraqi army is working in close co coordination with us. Um, we are hopeful that um, this will sort of rally the, the, the sentiment and, and garner more um, favor towards the NPU, such that people would be more encouraged um, to, to contribute more. I, I, I should add um, that, you know, the amount of contributions that we've gotten so far um, 
although welcome is, is certainly not enough, um, we certainly need you know, more people to step up. Um, 130 people is great, it's a start. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't get more, um, then it's going to compromise our ability to continue to, to um, establish this kind of security situation that we want to be able to establish for ourselves. Um, the, I think the important thing to recognize here is that a lot of people might think, well, we're working with the Iraqi military. Why isn't the Iraqi military giving us everything we need? Um, and why aren't they supplying us with, with, with more? Um, it's a fair question. It's a fair question. It's not to say that they have not given us stuff. They have given us some stuff. Um, and they are certainly now providing the salaries for 600 men. Um, and so that's certainly a first step. Um, but as we all know, the politics of Iraq is complicated. And so receiving um, more funding um, and um, more equipment um, is complicated by the larger politics of the country. Um, and yet, we're fighting a war today. We're fighting a war today. And I think everyone recognizes that um, politics um, can take months and months to play itself out. And so um, we really don't have that luxury. We, we need to be mobilizing ourselves. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for the politics to resolve more favorably towards us, and certainly, say, the ADM is working that angle and doing what it can, um, um, you know, our job is, as a, as a people in diaspora, our job is to recognize that our people right now are fighting and they need our help. They're asking for our help. You know, if, if we care about their survival in our homeland, then, then we should be stepping up. I mean, we're not asking for very much. We're asking for 1250 a month. You know, if you can do more, great, but 1250 a month, that's what we're asking. If, if we had thousands of people, and I'm sure there are thousands of people out there that, who care about the NPU, who want the NPU to survive, who want the Syrians to survive in their homeland and be able to provide an independent place for us to be able to live and be free, um, independent in sense of having a standalone in of a plain province, which is, I think, one of our longer term objectives. Um, that um, there are people that believe that, and if 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 we had fifty percent of the people that believe that donate, we would have thousands, um, potentially tens of thousands of people donating. So we need more people to support these the, the these these dreams, frankly, because these dreams aren't going to be real unless people support them. Okay. Well, I must admit that I'm disappointed. I, I am disappointed. Uh, to hear roughly 130 people have donated, um, given the amount of Assyrians that we, had, uh, that we have in all of diaspora, um, because this is 130 people across th the world, right? It's not, it's not just the United States? 130 across the world. Across the world. About half of our donors are in the United States. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we've got, I can't even give the number, but we've got hundreds of thousands living outside of diaspora. Um, well so, over a million. So there you go. Um, so we're talking, what, what's the percentage on that? Is that 0 0.001? It's small. <laughs> it's small. OK. Um, I won't sugarcoat it. I, I, I personally am very disappointed um, to see that we only have 130 donors. We see that the NPU is fighting. We see that they are on those lands, and they're protecting those lands, and they're willing to defend those lands so that when our people are prepared to return, they will be there to make sure that what has happened to us will not happen again. So what can we do in diaspora? We've protested, we've rallied, we've signed petitions, we've done it all. Now it's kind of one of those moments where they say, put your money where your mouth is. This is what we wanted, not supporting them. That's, that's one thing that's important for us to individually start building teams. Um, I know that that is an option on the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund.org website uh, to build a team. We all have our core group of friends. And yes, $12.50 a month is great, but we also need to understand that there's a bit of urgency right now. The war is happening now. 
they're, they're fighting there now. They're using trucks and, and um, equipment that belongs to the Iraqi army. Unfortunately, at any point, it could be taken away from us. At any point. For us to have salaries for these 600 men is great. But we know that we have, what is it, 2,000 plus that have enlisted and are ready to defend those lands. How can we get them onto the land? How can we make sure that they have the equipment that they need to defend those lands? Otherwise, we can't expect any of the people that are internally displaced within Iraq to return to their homes. Why would we let them risk that again? I'm just, I'm appalled that we only have 130 voters. Um, that Donors. Donors. Contributors. Donors. Yes, thank you. Um, you raise a lot of good points. Let me follow up on one of them, which is, you know, one of the ways to, to sort of uh, expand your contribution that you hinted at was the fact that what we're asking for real, uh, for supporters to do is to really get involved. Um, in other words, it's great if you become a contributor and you, you, you contribute 1250 a month. We, we love that, we want that, to, we want that to happen. But um, part of it is spreading the, the word and, and explaining what we're trying to do and conveying sort of the, the, the truth of the message um, the, and the sincerity that this is the only way that we're going to be able to sort of create something for ourselves within Iraq that, that I think we can all look um, and say that that's something that we can sustain ourselves over generations. Um, and the, the way that one can do that, expand their voice rather than just give 1250 a month, is, is to become a team leader. And essentially, you know, what we're asking for is for individual supporters to go out and essentially gather their friends and family and join um, the effort of supporting the NPU, not just as an individual, but as a team. And so you can go onto our website, you can actually call, uh, call yourself a team name, create a name. If, if you have a picture or logo that you want to create or use, you can use that and upload that. You identify who your team members are, and then each of the team members goes on and contributes. Just because the team um, just because the, the team is a team doesn't mean that everyone is required to give the same amount. Everyone can still give an individual amount up to the level at which they're able. Um, but this is another way for you to essentially get involved by getting other people um, to know about the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund, to get them to be a supporter and a believer in the mission for the Nineveh Plain Protection Units. Um, and I, I think it's, it's really an important mission. So like anyone who um, you know, feels that like, wow, I wish I could do more, like I'm only in the position to give 1250 a month. Um, 1250 a month's great, but you know what? If you can get 10 other friends together and they're all giving 150 bucks, well then you know what? 10 friends together giving 150 bucks, you, you especially if you were the team leader, you essentially helped raise fifteen hundred dollars that that's that's a pretty significant thing that might not happen but for the action of an individual team leader to sort of make that happen so we we really encourage it we want people to spread the word we want people to um um to to really explain to their friends because i think that's the only way that this is going to really take off is to have that kind of shared um that shared vision of, of what we can accomplish together thank you elmer We'll be right back after this brief break. وحدات حماية سلينوا في بغداد ترسل لكم أجمل السلام وأجمل التحايا. في دجاني سقي 
Thank you again for tuning in. Uh, in the last segment, we mentioned uh, that we have 130, roughly 130 donors as of right now. Uh, so one of the biggest things that I'm, I'm going to request for those of you that are watching, take the time right now to go to your computer or do it on your phone, type in www.ninevaplanedefensefund.org and click the support now button. Whatever it is that you can contribute will make a difference. So please, I'm gonna urge you, I'm gonna ask of you to visit the website and support the NPU today at NinevaPlaneDefenseFund.org. Now, with those donations, Dr. Elmer, where, where are these donations going? What is it right. that we're gonna be purchasing? Right, so um, when we started this, um, we started this in a very different position because essentially the Nineveh Plain Protection Units was 350 men but a month ago. Um, and now um, a couple things have happened um, in, in the last month. As you mentioned originally, um, the uh, NPU was given authority from the Iraqi government to call up an additional 250 men. And so now, officially, we have 600 full-time men. Um, but uh, just over the weekend, the NPU called up 1,000 volunteer reservists, or made a call for volunteer reservists, and the goal is to bring up 100, or bring up 1,000 additional men. Um, this is amazing news. I, I can't tell you how important this is. Um, because when we started this with the Defense Fund and when we looked at the situation that we were facing, we recognized that actually our most important asset, um, as in speaking now for the NPU, was to literally have people on the ground that were willing to protect and defend the land. And so 
Um, you know, the Nineveh Plains, depending on where you draw the lines, is somewhere around you know 1,200 to 1,500 square miles. Um, and um, the you know the idea of that whole area being defended with just 350 men is is sort of unrealistic. Um, now, um, so when we were looking at this, the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund recognized that actually one of the things that we could help do was support that full-time force by bringing in additional resources that would help to train additional men to serve as reservists. Um, and so our initial fundraising strategy actually has been um, to bring in money that would help fund and train additional reservists. And what we refer to this as is our trainer reservist program. Um, and we certainly have had people go onto our website and when they've donated, they've donated specifically targeting um, the, the trainer reservist program. Um, and ultimate, or originally, um, our goal was to actually train uh, an additional um, 4,000 men um, in our trainer reservist program. Um, or 4,800 men, um, sorry, 400 a month. Uh, our initial goal was to train 400 men a month for a year, that's 4,800 um, additional men, uh, to get us to a number of about 5,000 men. Now, we always knew that that was an ambitious goal. We, we were frank about it, we were, you know, we, we always acknowledged it. But we, always, but we also said if we could even reach 25% of that goal, frankly, we'd be happy. Um, because then that would give us at least a footprint of you know over a thousand, a thousand, fifteen hundred men somewhere in that somewhere in that range. That kind of footprint potentially is enough to be able to spread out across that square footage um, and be able to protect and defend it. Um, now, granted, a volunteer reservist is not the same as a full-time soldier. Um, a volunteer reservist would be someone who's there who can do the initial, or who, who's there and who can respond in a crisis, but um, in general they're going to be living their life and doing things. On the other hand, it's someone who could step up in the time of need and, and help play a critical role. And right now, certainly as the, the active um, offensive against the Islamic State is going on, this is one of those times for sure. Um, and so we're incredibly enthusiastic that um, the Nineveh Plain Protection Units has actually put out this call to, to um, bring in volunteer reservists um, and has done so under the authorization of the Iraqi army. And the Iraqi army um, has um, said that they would be able to provide light arms for these individuals. Um, so. Um, so there's another example there that where the Iraqi army is giving us support. However, they are reservists. Um, they are volunteers. They're not going to get a full-time salary. Um, that said, even with the program that we were planning on putting in place on our, on our own, we were only intending to um, pay for training of the, um, uh, of the reservists. We were not going to be providing the reservist salaries. Um, however, even training costs some money. Um, those, those costs are still there, um, but um, the biggest cost um, was to pay a stipend for the reservists to be able to come and participate. Now that the Nineveh Plain Protection Units is sort of doing this on its own, without the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund providing some resources, the Nineveh Plain Protection Units has decided it just needs to do this now because of the urgency of the security situation, they need to get additional men on the ground. They are going ahead and just doing this now, and hopefully volunteers will step up. I'm, in, I'm optimistic and encouraged that they will be. Um, and, and so the reservists, the, the idea of having volunteer reservists and the idea of the Nineveh Plain Protection Unit rapidly expanding its footprint is occurring. And that was an initial sort of goal, or initial objective, that the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund had um, focused in on. Um, we saw that as an opportunity for us to, to provide a tremendous amount of value to leverage our influence in the diaspora. How can we most, most leverage our, our resources? 
to have the greatest impact. Well, now if we already have this larger footprint of people on the ground, or we're going to have that very quickly, and it's happening without the Nineveh Plain Defense Fund bringing any additional resources to bear, well then, maybe we should be looking for, well, what is the next best thing to use our dollars for? Um, and as we've been in conversation with the leaders of the NPU, um, it's emerged that one of the um, essential things that we need to be putting in place is a network of checkpoints. Um, so as you can imagine, if you've spent any time traveling in that area, essentially as you go from village to village, you can't enter into a village without going through a checkpoint. Um, that's an, um, an essential method and mechanism of, of creating security and frankly, controlling entry and passage through that land. So it's clear that the Nineveh Plain Protection Unit, since we are the local security force within the Nineveh Plain, and we are authorized and operating under the jurisdiction of the Iraqi government, um, that we need to set up an infrastructure of checkpoints throughout the Nineveh Plain. Um, currently, the, the, the checkpoints that are there are, are really just, you know, a shack for someone to stand in. It's, mm -hmm. There's no we desperately need to, to control passage in and out of the villages. Um, we need to know who's going in, who's going out. Um, and the only way that we can do that is through having effective checkpoints. And the checkpoints can't be just a shack. They have to, we have to upgrade and make them more robust and secure so that, you know, a car has to, as they approach, has to stop and, you know, be, in, you know, be inspected. Um, so it's become clear to us that um, the best use of our initial distribution of resources to the Nineveh Plain Protection Units is going to be to help the Nineveh Plain Protection Units develop this network of checkpoints. And that is going to be our focus. We're going to be transitioning away from the trainer reservist program. And it's not to say that we don't want to train other individuals in the future. Um, but whereas some of our initial dollars before were going to go to the reservist program, it's clear that that's not the most important need right now. Um, and I say that because there already are men being brought to bear by the NPU without these additional resources. So if they're already doing it, then we need to do something that's not being done or not being done effectively. And it's clear that we need to um, invest in a network of checkpoints. The longer term goal is to have approximately 18 checkpoints spread throughout the Nineveh Plain. Um, we need to develop them um, and we need to build them. Um, for now, our initial focus is to focus in on four checkpoints. We need to create um, two checkpoints for Baghdad, and then we need to do uh, a checkpoint for Karam, Karam Lesh and um, Bartella. Um, so that's our initial focus, is to develop those four checkpoints. Now, what's involved? Well, to be honest, in some ways, the materials are not that demanding. It's, it's concrete you know, structures and blocks like that. You, you can buy concrete relatively cheaply um, and these kinds of things. Um, so from a materials point of view, it's a, it's a, a couple thousand dollars, perhaps. However, the checkpoints themselves are not effective unless you also have vehicles to patrol in between the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. um, so ideally, we would have at least one vehicle, um, an you know, SUV type vehicle, um, one vehicle to essentially go between the checkpoints. Um, you can imagine if there was an emergency at one checkpoint, you'd want people to be able to come to their aid quickly. Um, you can't have people running for miles between checkpoints. You, you need vehicles. So essentially, we need approximately $24,000 to develop each checkpoint. That's a couple thousand dollars for materials. And then it's about $22,000 to buy a, a used um, SUV. It would be a little bit more with new vehicles. We hope that we'll be able to purchase used effectively if, if there's not enough supply of used vehicles, we might have to actually look to, to, to pay and purchase used or to purchase new vehicles. But 
um, each checkpoint then costs about twenty-four thousand um, dollars, and um, we want a network of eighteen checkpoints. If you do the math, eighteen thousand times twenty twenty-four thousand, that's four hundred and thirty-two thousand um, dollars. That's a reasonable amount of money. It's it's real, but it's a reasonable amount of money already. Now we've, based on what's been pledged, um, we have about ten percent of that money raised. Um, so um, that said, that's pledged over the course of the year. We only have 5% in hand. Um, we are hoping that we generate a little bit more money over the next um, few days and that we make the first installment to at least per, you know, um, have enough uh, money to purchase at least one vehicle and maybe enough materials for two checkpoints. And we'll hopefully then um, make that distribution, like I said, in the next week or two. Um, then um, we're going to continue to raise money and we're asking for support. As you can imagine, if we don't have this network of checkpoints, then we won't have the effective safety and security that our people are really going to need to feel comfortable to move back into, the, to, into their villages. Um, so I can't emphasize enough how important this is and um, you know what an important contribution it would be for Assyrians and diaspora to know that they are helping us essentially build and maintain a network of checkpoints. Um, that is um, an incredible gift that we could give our people. It's, it's not an expensive gift, um, and it's within reach. Um, and so if we can mobilize people around this idea, um, um, we think that we could um, help to grow and put this network of checkpoints in over the next um, few months. We certainly think we can get four checkpoints built, um, hopefully by the end of the year. If the, if the contributions are there, we're certainly going to keep moving towards it. Clearly, um, uh, again, the building the materials for the checkpoints is not nearly as expensive as the vehicles, but we need the vehicles and approximately one vehicle per checkpoint for the checkpoint system, for the whole network and the whole infrastructure to make sense and for it to work effectively. Um, and so um, we're going to just keep um, you know, spreading the idea that this is what people are going to be contributing to. Um, and we hope that that's an idea that people can see the value of and see the direct results. Um, you know, as we build out these checkpoints, we'll show people the pictures, mm -hmm. we'll, um, um, we'll um, show people um, what they're purchasing in terms of the vehicles, and they'll get a sense of where their money is going. And of course, I did hint at this already, but um, as we start to actually distribute money, and, um, and the NPU starts to make the purchases within Iraq, um, we will document all of that and disclose it and put it all on our website because I do think it's important that people see where their money is going and that there be transparency. We're, I mean, it's their money and they should know where it's going. Thank you, Elmer. Uh, do you have any other final message <laughs> for our people at this point? Um, <clears throat> so, the, the, the Nineveh Plain Protection Units um, is providing security for our people to move back into our homeland. Um, and, and certainly um, that security is essential. Um, the fact that our people um, can feel safe to move back in is essential. Um, but the Nineveh Plain Protection Units is playing um, a, um, another important sort of longer term role, and that's frankly creating the, the space for a province to develop and grow within the Nineveh Plain, and that this province would um, stand equal to other provinces within Iraq and um, be independent of the Kurdistan regional government and therefore be able to garner resources um, from the government of Iraq. Um, have representation for our people according to the population within the area. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how important that, um, that longer term political reality is for our people and our sort of ability to um, create a space for ourselves where we can sort of grow and feel comfortable. Um, to have Assyrian villages become towns and then sl slowly become cities. Um, 
we need to see um, the Nineveh Plain become a central homeland for us. Um, and I think that's only going to be effectively accomplished if um, that space is um, created in a way that allows our people to express themselves politically and represent their, their views and their interests politically. And the only way that that is accomplished within the current larger structure within Iraq is as a standalone Nineveh Plain province. And I think it's essential for people to understand that longer term vision. It's, um, it's short term about security and it's longer term about the, 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 the NPU becoming a local security force for a, uh, an, an independent Nineveh Plain province um, that, helps, um, that helps our people and then all other people that are living within the Nineveh Plains live freely and, and express themselves. Um, and I, I think that that's a, an essential vision. Um, and if you believe and support in that vision, then you should be contributing and supporting the Nineveh Plain Protection Units. Um, there's no question in my mind. Thank you, Elmer. I mean, he said it. You've got the short-term goal. You've got the long-term goal. You've got an organization that's been put together in diaspora to fund the NPU legally. They've gone through all of their board. They have the structure to be a part of this. Um, it's, it's all great if it's on paper, but if we don't do anything to actually put it into motion, then it's, it all goes to waste. Uh, so we all need to think about it. And I'm going to encourage every single one of you uh, to, to go again to the website, NinevahPlainDefenseFund.org, and donate. I've hosted numerous events in the Chicagoland area specifically where I've charged anywhere from $20 to $150 per ticket. I've hosted sellout events that have had over 1,000, 1,500 people attending just for a party or just for a dinner. We can spend the money on things like that. We can spend the money on Starbucks. We can spend the money on a night out. We can spend the money on food. For one week, don't get your Starbucks coffee. For one week, don't eat out. It's that simple. Just one night, sacrifice one Saturday night. Sacrifice one party. Sacrifice something. Because they're putting their lives on the line. It's our duty to support them. Again, I will ask you to visit www.NinevahPlainDefenseFund.org and donate. Support our soldiers today. Thank you. علم عراقي هذا العلم ليلة وعلم كلوا الله كريم باغ بغداد الدولة موحدة، باغ دعيشة بسلامة من كل